Well, hello, everybody. I hope you are having a wonderful day because it is about to get even better. This is TJ Murphy, and welcome to another episode of Adventurous Entrepreneurs. My guest today is Jared Hanning. Jared is an award-winning speaker who has been featured on ABC Nightline and spoken on stages across the country, including four TEDx talks related to mindset performance, which led him to be chosen by TED Global as a featured speaker of the week. Jared runs a mindset gym called Mindset Performance, where he trains the brains of clients worldwide to think at a higher level. And as a result of his training, most entrepreneurs that work with him quickly double their business. I'm intrigued. So I hope you are too. And just a few of the golden takeaways that Jared shares in this episode are three simple steps that anyone can follow to double their income and time off. The power of mindset push-ups and philosophies on what it means to be a great dad. I had a blast recording this episode, and I personally walked away with several action steps to help me grow my own business and create more freedom in my life. So without further ado, this is me and Jared Hanning. Welcome to the Adventurous Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, TJ Murphy. Since quitting my corporate nine to five and starting a business while backpacking through Asia back in early 2017, I've had the privilege of learning from some incredibly adventurous entrepreneurs. Through these conversations and my own journey, I've learned that much like in life, entrepreneurship is an adventure. On this podcast, I explore the journeys of top performing leaders in their fields. These wide ranging conversations include tactical business advice, how I built this insights, lessons in leadership, life hacks, travel stories, favorite hobbies, and insights into living a purposeful and joy-filled life. Adventures await us, so let's dive in. Hey, Jared, welcome to Adventurous Entrepreneurs. Uh, happy to be here. This is going to be uh, an adventuresome conversation, no pun intended. It, it will indeed. I'm, I'm excited for it, and it's great to have you here. When we first yeah. met a few weeks back, I immediately thought to myself, I need to get this guy on my podcast. So I'm stoked to have manifested that and to have you with me here today. Yeah, let's dive in. Yeah, let's do it, man. So a lot to dive into, particularly focusing on mindset and how as entrepreneurs, we can really learn how to double our income and, and double our time off by learning how to stop doing things and start causing things to happen, using your mm -hmm. own words here. Yes, but sir. before we dive into that, I always like to start with a bit of background on the journey. So in my research, if I'm not mistaken, I learned that you were previously a principal violist in the South Carolina Philharmonic. And I know there's an interesting, interesting, words are hard, interesting story to be told about your life leading up to you becoming the adventurous entrepreneur you are today. So can you give us a little bit of context on your journey before we... Um, Dive into the sure. mindset performance gym that you run today. Sure. Uh, so the adventure part was always there. Um, lots of skydiving and motorcycles and climbing and uh, technical rappelling rope weird work stuff. Um, the adventure was always there. Um, but I did have a part of me that I could not turn off and a, kind of a mental illness that would be being a musician. Mm. Uh, I, I just could not do it for many decades. Uh, I was principal viola with the South Carolina Philharmonic. I played with them for 20 years. And the I think what could be interesting about that is some people don't know this, but when you're engaged in music, um, whether you are singing along to the radio or clapping along to your favorite band, in the moment that you're co-creating, you're not like passively just listening, but you're actually participating on some level you're using more different parts of your brain than any other time of your life. Uh, this is a sharp contrast to athletic performance where the better your body performs, the less of your brain you're using. And uh, the reason I mention that is because when you learn how to access different parts of your brain on demand, then it changes the way you think about growing your business and scaling to the next level. Um, it effectively uh, not just eliminates, but it kind of disappears, if you will, the obstacles that you have been encountering, don't have enough time, don't have enough money, whatever it is, because your brain is just thinking at a higher level. Yeah. I love that. So let's bring things forward to what you're focused on today, particularly. And I'd love to hear about your mindset, Jim. And I love how you call it that. And really how you help entrepreneurs train their brain to think at a higher level. And in many cases, which we'll dive into, double their business. 
Yeah, you can't change thinking with thinking, as it turns out, um, which is why you read the book and go to the seminar and not much changes. Um, you're still making the same amount of money you did three years ago. Um, information doesn't make a difference. Knowing what to do doesn't make a difference. Like, come on, you know what to do to save money. You know what to do to lose weight. But knowing doesn't actually move the needle. Uh, so at the Mindset Gym, we aren't giving you advice. We aren't telling you what you do because you change thinking patterns through the body. And by putting the clarity and confidence inside your body, your brain is forced to rewire itself to make sense of it. So we train your brain how to think at a higher level. And we do that with a series of exercises called mindset pushups. Um, and by doing this, it just gets you out of the weeds. So the, yeah. for the entrepreneurs at the gym, they quickly double their business revenue just because they're no longer in the weeds and their brain is thinking at a higher level on how it solves some of those problems. That's amazing. So I read a quote of yours that said, the less you do, the more you make. And I imagine that's that's a main tagline for, for everything that you're doing at the gym. Can you expand on how entrepreneurs and, and really anyone can and should apply that concept to their business if their goal is ultimately to work less and earn more, which should be the case for most of us. <laughs> which should be the case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the idea is if you're doing the same thing that you were last year, then you're not actually growing. You're, you're not leveling up, developing as a person. Um, but even on a much smaller scale, Anytime you do the same task twice, you want to think really hard about why. Because if you do the same task twice, that implies a system could be doing it for you. So what is it about that task that you're so unwilling to let go of? Um, whenever you're doing the work, you're actually the bottleneck. You're getting in the way. While you're doing that task, it, it does not matter how good you are at it, how fast you can get it done. In the block of time that you were doing the task, there's like 27 other things that aren't getting done. At this least. is what we call a bad strategy. You can't solve a bad strategy with stubbornness. And what's worse about doing the work, it's not just that other things aren't getting done. And so, you know, you have to switch to that other thing. And now this isn't getting done. It's not juggling three balls. That, that's what's even worse about it is that doing something doesn't address why it ever had to be done to start with. And so tomorrow you're still going to have the same demand to do the same thing. Yeah. Um, this is like trying to be more productive by sending emails. Email is not a productivity tool. Every email you send creates 1.2 new emails that get generated in return. Um, so yes, if you're doing the work, you're falling behind. And the reason it's true that the less you work, the more you make is because by stopping trying to do everything and starting causing things to be done with relationships, with um, processes, with systems, by building little machines, if you will, little ecosystems to do those tasks for you, it allows you to reach more people, make a di bigger difference. And you just end up with more and more free time on your calendar to build more and more systems and relationships to do the work for you. Um, it's just a big lever. hundred percent. And I mean, I think everyone is there at some point. I know I've gotten better at some of this stuff, but I'm still doing things that I absolutely need to create better systems for and, and delegate or outsource so that I can have more of that time to focus on higher value, higher revenue generating activities. And I'd imagine this all starts with, with people that you work with re really auditing and figuring out what are all the things that you are doing twice, 20 times, 100 times every day that you no longer need to be doing. Is there any kind of system you follow or framework that people can use to start to identify this stuff? Um, yes and yes. Uh, so to the first question, the framework that we use um, we are mapping out the thinking patterns. I've got a picture here. Um, we're using a Nobel nominated process to map those thinking patterns out because that reveals the blind spot. The only reason you keep hitting the same obstacles you do is because there's a blind spot in that way of thinking. Because it's your way of thinking, it's like water for a fish. You mm. can't see it. It's all you've ever known. 
Yeah. But that blind spot is why you keep hitting the same income ceiling every year. It's why there's always more on your to-do list and you have time to get done. And so by using this process, it takes the guesswork out of the work we're doing. We know exactly which mindset pushups you need to be doing and the order you need to do them in. Outside of coming to the mindset gym, there is uh, a couple things you can do on your own uh, to start to suss that out. Uh, so I'm going to give you kind of a three-step method here. Perfect. Document your time and put a price tag next to it and then put a buy when next to it. Um, so a little bit more details there. When you document your time, do not get like a, a spreadsheet and break it up into, you know, 15 or 30 minute blocks and, and try to document your day in those blocks. And because life doesn't unfold that way, uh, life rarely stays on track and you'll end up spending more time writing half in this box and then half in the other box. And then now that you've got boxes broken up into halves or thirds or things are spilling over, you end up spending more time trying to get it documented than the value you would have gotten out of it. And when it is squeezed in there, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And now you've got to go back and reinterpret it. And so you, what usually happens is people just quit because yep. it doesn't work. It's not effective. What you do instead is you, I'm, I'm kind of digital. So whether you use iPad or a piece of paper or whatever, um, you write the time 9.07 AM, like whatever, write the time that you start that specific task, not project, but specific task. Are you in email, right? Are you in phone calls? Are you social media? Whatever that task is, you write the time that you start it. And then when you switch to the next task, you write the time that you switched. This way, it's very easy to document as it unfolds because you're not squeezing it into things. Um, a couple of things you'll notice, uh, you stay on task a whole lot longer. Uh, mm -hmm. You're a whole lot more focused doing this because you don't want to pause to write down that you hopped on Facebook to waste 10 minutes. So you just don't hop on Facebook to waste 10 minutes. Um, but more than that, at the end, if you, if you just do this for two or three days, at the end of that, you have a list of everything that needs to be documented. I mean, delegated, um, a system built, right. A process made. And so that's the next step. I said, you know, document it and then put a dollar amount next to it. So go to, go back to your list, all those little tasks that you were doing. I was scheduling, I was rescheduling, I was prospecting, I was calling, I was serving clients using this method that I use, whatever. Go back to that list and put a dollar amount on what it would cost you to delegate that task provided, provided that the person you delegated it to had a system and a process to follow and they were trained on how to use it, right? Yeah. If there was the right one page, bullet point, simple picture, screenshot for them to copy, could you delegate that task for $10 an hour? Yes. Every day and twice on Sunday. What you'll yeah. find out is there's nothing on your list that could not be delegated for $15 or $20 an hour. So what that means is the more excited you are about checking things off your to-do list, the more excited you are about paying yourself the lowest rate possible. Okay, so the next challenge that I mentioned there, write out, document your time. we got a process to do that. Put a dollar amount next to it. Got a process for that. And the last one is buy when. Next to each of those items on the to-do list, buy when will you create the simple two or three page process and match that with a virtual assistant. Like no magic wand thinking, well, it's just going to get done this week. No, specifically no, <laughs> what day and what time are you going to sit down and work on this? Block that off on your schedule. If you will do that, you will find that you have nothing left to do, but <laughs> build higher value relationships and um, bring more business into your machine. I love that. And it's, you know, following the smart goal framework, it is specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, and you have a time attached to it. And that's the most important piece to create the accountability. But I really love at the beginning, instead of using a spreadsheet or trying to block it all off in your calendar, which I am certainly guilty of and have failed at doing the time audit that way, probably at least three or four times now, this is way more simple, which I love. You break it down in a great way. You've got three steps to follow. 
that's something that anybody can do, but you got to be diligent. You got to put pen to paper and follow through on it. So one, uh, sorry, if I could interrupt this please, please. briefly, because um, what people scream at this point is, well, I would if I had the time, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have the time to find an assistant. I don't have the time to train them. I don't have the time to document the process. The next thing people scream is, well, I would if I had the money to hire an assistant, but I don't have the money to hire an assistant. Thus the saying, if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. Yeah. Here's the deal. This is not black and white thinking. You've got 20 bucks to hire a virtual assistant for two hours one week. Like yeah. you can get started on a part-time basis. Yeah. If you'll do that, you'll find it starts to train your brain to think at a higher level. Think more like a CEO that exits and scales, not a solopreneur that keeps putting more on their plate. You start to get trained to think at a higher level. The other thing it does is it frees up a little bit of time in your schedule so that you could go to work on the higher value tasks, namely signing contracts and attracting more business into your ecosystem. Yeah. Building up the brand. So many things, you know, I've, I've started down this path and hearing it is just such a great reinforcement into how much more I can be doing. And I'd love to touch on some success stories because this is a process you've given us a simpler version, but how have you been able to you know, get your clients to implement this and take things to a higher level? And are there you know, any specific success stories that come to mind where you've taken somebody through that transformational mindset shift? Many, many stories. What it's like coming to the mindset gym. Um, consider, if you will, that you do not have problems in your life. You have patterns. You have patterns of behavior that keep reproducing the same undesirable results. But it's worse than that. You don't just have patterns of behavior. You have a, a pattern of thinking a set of observations and beliefs about the world. So it's not like your patterns are happening in a vacuum. There's, there's no need to beat yourself up for that. The catch is your brain can't think of what it can't think of. If it could, you already would have by now, which is why the saying, don't work hard, work smarter is so infuriating to me because your brain cannot think of what it can't think of. <laughs> It just has you creating more of the same solutions that keep you in the same kind of miserable stuckedness. So coming to the Mindset Gym um, isn't life coaching. Uh, it's not business coaching. It's training to think at a higher level. And when you do that, you can actually feel your brain making new connections. And um, let's talk about how that affects your business and what life is like for the people that do that. Um, had a guy in commercial real estate, and he's got the golden handcuffs on. He is making just a little bit too much money to take him off, but not nearly enough money for life to work. And he's just working way too many hours a week. He's just flat miserable. After coming to the Mindset Gym, he realizes that his job comes down to three to five key phone calls a day. So that's what he does now. He makes three to five key phone calls a day. He makes $300,000 a year, plays golf the rest of the time. Had um, a lady who was a stay-at-home mom. And she's very happy being a stay-at-home mom, but inside it felt like something was calling her to step up to a bigger level. And she was very frustrated because she couldn't put into words. She couldn't tell you what life was calling her to. And this is frustrating because for her, it, that sounds like, you know, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? What's your favorite color? It should be a question anyone can answer, but she couldn't answer it. Comes to the Mindset Gym, gets clarity on her zone of genius, how she is uniquely wired to contribute back to the world. I'm telling you, when you have clarity, confidence shows up instantly. Now, 100%. in her case, her zone of genius was worth $10,000 an hour. Let me show you what that was, because most people are like, the only person I know who makes 10 grand an hour is a grifting politician, right? It is, is, a, is, a, is a law breaking Hedge, uh, hedge fund manager is a cryptocurrency rug puller. You know, those are the people who make, no, 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 no. It's a great examples. She has an ability to understand demographic data in a way that the people who live in that city 
can't see it. So when she stacks demographic reports, she finds threads that connects them that lead her to real estate investment opportunities. And these multi-million dollar packages are putting hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit into her pocket. When she spends her time using her skill set of stacking demographic reports, this ability of hers is so robust that her husband quit his job to go to work for her new company. Um, had a lady nonprofit executive who felt like her life was wrangling cats, comes to the mindset gym and realizes that her time, her skill set is worth $5,000 an hour. The one thing she does that makes the biggest difference. Um, there's an equation that we take that through, but I've never seen an entrepreneur worth less than $500 an hour. If you do the math, that's a million a year. If you aren't making a million a year, what that means is you're just not clear on the one thing that makes the biggest difference in your business. Come to the Mindset Gym and we will fix that <laughs> very quickly. Um, let's see here. One more story. Uh, had a lady who had a side hustle. Uh, this is the Adventure and Entrepreneurship <clears throat> channel. I, I would imagine there could be some people out there with side hustles. So she had, sure. a, she had a side hustle. And um, her side hustle was making cookies, <laughs> very wow. artistic cookies. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with like uh, Kyle, uh, the Marine um, who, who wrote the book comes out. She does cookies for all his uh, award events. Uh, John nice. Daly, the golfer, she does cookies for all his events. Well, this is, she's working nights and weekends to do these and she's working 60 hours only nights and weekends. So total, she's working hundred hours a week, just burning the candle at both ends, comes to the mindset gym, gets clarity on how she's driven, how she's uniquely wired, how she's uniquely gifted to give back to the world. That clarity, like I said before, confidence shows up instantly. She's now operating in a higher gear. She triples her income the first year and cuts her production time in half. Um, this allowed her a greater self-expression and power out in the world because it wasn't just time and money. It was what was she doing in her business that made the biggest difference and was the most rewarding. It's amazing. And the theme of all of those stories is freedom. We get into business well, to create more money, but the goal with the money is to create more freedom. And all of those things, whether it's having more time to golf, having time to spend with your kids. I know you're a baseball dad, having that time to go to practice and to games on the weekends. I'm sure that is first and foremost, your number one priority. So having that mindset shift is what allows us to create more freedom in our lives. And I'm curious, I mean, the mindset gym, people need to check it out. I know I'm going to be checking it out, but what are some practical tips that or exercises even that people listening can implement to improve their mindset and performance outside of auditing and delegating and outsourcing all of the things that are not moving the needle the most. Yeah. So, so the gym is, is training um, yeah. mindset pushups that creates clarity and confidence outside of coming to the gym. Um, and it only takes 90 days to complete the training. Um, but outside of coming to the gym, here are the four C's of transformation. The first one is a crucible moment. Um, a crucible moment in your life is never something that you asked for. Um, sometimes it's just accidental and sometimes it's colossal lack of planning on your part. But the thing about a crucible, a, a fiery high pressure test is in order to survive, your brain has to rewire itself. Uh, a crucible is not a fun way to level up your thinking. The next one is a champion in your life. A champion is somebody who is actually doing the thing that you want to do. The catch is, this is just how they've always thought. They can't not th think this way. Yeah. And so anything they tell you how to think that way isn't going to apply to you. So here's what you do with a champion instead. You sit on the floor of their office and you listen to them take calls and you write notes. And what you're listening for is their way of looking at the world, their energy, their, their perspective of all the things they could have said in that moment. Why did they say that thing? That's what you're looking for with the champion. You're also looking for the things in their life that they are not doing. Um, the main reason that you aren't at their level is because your day is filled with a bunch of little stuff that they aren't doing. So we got to cut that out. Um, outside of a crucible moment and a champion, there is a coach. Um, you don't go to the Olympics without a coach. If you aren't performing on an Olympic level, 
and you don't have a coach, there could be a connection there. Um, but the coach's job is to understand the science and the specific stretch, the specific exercise, the specific order of them that produces that result. Um, training with a coach. Uh, the crucible moment is free. It just costs you in longevity from the stress you go through it, right? The champion is usually free. Um, the coach can be expensive. Uh, if you get one who knows what they're doing, obviously. And then the next one is community, uh, which is also very, very expensive. The key with community is because you rise to the level of the expectations of your peers, it's very easy to join a community of people who want to learn how to do the thing that you want to learn how to do. The problem is that's just more of the same. That's more people already like you. We don't need that. You need to join a community of people who are already doing the thing that you want to do. And this is tough because they're not going to want you around because you're not on their level. So either you have to start producing results quickly or you have to pay a lot of money. Uh, but those four C's, um, very accessible ways to access thinking at a higher level and um, get that transformation happening. Love it. Success leaves clues, find your champion, find your tribe. Even if you got to pay to be in there, the, the ROI from investments, and I can attest to it myself are profound. I mean, the more you can surround yourself with people that are where you want to be in life and can study and really, as you said, sit on the floor and take notes and listen and leave all of your, you know, pre-existing thought patterns on the other side of the door, better things are going to be for you. So a bit of a segue here. You've spoken on TEDx stages, I believe mm -hmm. four, four times, right? Yes. Four TEDx. And, yes. Awesome. And you were named a featured speaker of the week by TED Global. So that makes you the most accomplished TED speaker I've ever spoken to. So <laughs> Jokes aside though, man, can you share your experience uh, delivering TEDx talks and, and being chosen as a featured speaker of the week by TED Global? Like how has that impacted your work as a speaker and, and as a, a gym leader? I don't want to call it a coach because you've, you've made that clear. It's not coach trainer. Yeah, trainer. There we go. Gym trainer. Train. Uh, okay. So leveraging TEDx for your business, that is in my experience, um, purely a reflection of your current tribe, uh, meaning your relationships, uh, the strength and value in those relationships, um, how many people know, like, and trust you, yep. um, TEDx does not change that. Um, if you don't already have people that know, like, and trust you, TEDx isn't going to fix that. Because it's those people, it's that warm network that start to get the early views in your TEDx video and start to share it so that it could potentially go viral. Um, many people point to Simon Sinek as a, as a success story with his, um, you know, start with why yeah. speech, uh, which is obviously a wonderful speech and so wonderful that um, TED Global uh, which I think Ted global is something like $5,000 a ticket to go to. And even then you still have to be invited to sit in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, Ted global uh, adopted that and put it on their platform. It was originally a Ted X speech, a locally governed. But the thing with that speech is it's not just that it was good. It's that for years leading up to that, he was giving that speech and refining it in the living rooms and small coffee shops with his friends he kept refining it and refining it and refining it and refining it and building that network out and more and more people wanted to share it and hear it. So there was tremendous momentum already behind the scenes before he ever stepped on the TED stage. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for TEDx to launch your business, odds are it's not going to happen <laughs> if you don't already have the social network built out. Um, the, the second thing though is TEDx getting on the stage at TEDx is, is fairly simple. And that's, it's free for crying out loud. Uh, every city across the nation has got a TEDx event once a year. It's just a matter of contacting the organizers and saying, Hey, when are you guys doing speaker selections and interviewing for that event? That's it. Uh, and if you don't get chosen for that event, it doesn't mean that they didn't want you. It doesn't mean that your idea wasn't Ted worthy. It just means that they might have already had three other people scheduled to speak that day on a similar topic. And um, 
So your idea might be better for another city where they don't have anybody who can speak on that specific topic. Um, And then the only other thing there is, while it's not personal, if you don't get chosen, because it could have to do with the the whole list of speakers that day, they want a balanced event. It is a little challenging. What makes your idea uh, inspiring or interesting or or shareable? Um, and some people are better at teasing that out than others. Um, but ultimately that is what, what makes it a TEDx worthy topic. Mm-hmm. And I love the Simon Sinek example because, you know, for anybody that wants to increase their reach, have more impact stages are a great place to do that, but you don't have to, you know, in your, in your words, like TEDx is accessible to anyone, but it doesn't need to be TEDx worthy yet. You need to have those smaller engagements, whether that's at a networking group, a coffee house with your friends, working on your signature talk, which for Simon at that point, that was it. And hone it over time, get the feedback, get more comfortable with it, make it more valuable, become a better speaker so that you continue to level up. And when you do get on that TEDx stage or whatever the stage may be, you're going to have a greater impact. Yes, sir. So Jared, This is a podcast about entrepreneurship, but I think we can all agree one of the biggest hurdles that most successful entrepreneurs face at one time or another is living a well-rounded life and creating the freedom that they ultimately started a business to create in the first place. What does living a well-rounded life look like for you and and how are you able to balance your business and, and anything else that you do in life? with the things that bring you joy and, you know, being with your family, being on that baseball field, all the fun stuff you like to do. Um, I, for me, round, well-rounded is, is seasonal. Like it depends on what season yeah. of your life you're in. Um, I've got a friend of mine whose goal was to travel to 40 different companies, countries before he was 40 years old. Companies and he actually cool. s- surpassed that. Um, and he is going to hit 50 countries by the time he's 40 years old. And he did it working, um, a completely very modest income, um, like nothing that, uh, maybe say a school teacher wouldn't make. Um, he was just extremely frugal and very good at, uh, saving and budgeting and leveraging travel points, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but, but for me, I'm in a baseball dad season. Um, I work about 25 hours a week and I spend about 20 hours a week with my kid. Um, taking him to private lessons and doing research for different schools and techniques we can practice and play and catch in the front yard. And uh, so for me right now, that is a balanced life. Um, I have my personal exercise, uh, mountain bike and lifting weights. Um, but that's a balanced life for me. Um, very, very happy with that. Um, certainly I've had other times in my life where balance was, When's the last time I traveled to to go skydiving in in another country? Um, or when's the last, right? And one of my f- favorite travel stories <laughs> related to skydiving um, and travel <laughs> was in jumping. I had always thought I wanted to be uh, get my base my base yep. license. Um, and I was in Switzerland. Uh, Zurich was crazy uh, in Zurich the the public fountains just walking about the sidewalks downtown area the public fountains are drinking water it's it's purified drinking water you can just take your water bottle and fill it up right there it's designed yeah. for that zurich was so clean it was beautiful but we get outside of that and now we're now in lauterbrunnen um switzerland and in, in the mountains uh you've seen many movies that were filmed in that valley um, the chocolate is will just melt your brain. Your brain goes, okay, now I understand why they say this about Swiss chocolate. I get it. This is what chocolate is supposed to taste like. Yes, it is that good. But in Lauterbrunnen, the the valleys, um, it's a it's a major base jumping um, destination. And there, so we're there, and you're just beautiful scenery, and you're seeing all these base jumpers and their canopies, and they land and walk back up and do it again. And so there's this community of base jumpers that's there all the time. And I thought, Hey, I'm a skydiver. We have something in common. Yep. No, we don't. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) No, we don't. Um, I I was like, so I'm going to go talk to him. So I went up to strike up a conversation with some of these base jumpers and 
it's like we're not the same. Um, it's like there was something missing in their eyes, like nobody was home. Um, <laughs> and I realized these are different people. Yeah. They uh they are very and at that point, I kind of put base jumping as a thing I'd want to try on the shelf. I was like, you know what? This might not be in alignment with with who I am and what life is calling me to do. Takes a unique breed to jump off of a mountain. <laughs> do you have any rules or like having I mean, you're clearly an adventurous person from skydiving to traveling and everything that you like to do? Do you have any rules, habits, or, or practices, ways of structuring your year as a family that enable you to create more adventure in your life? If you're doing the work, you're falling behind. Yeah. Yeah. If I do the same test twice, I need to think really hard about it. A system could be doing this for me. Um, is this task really what I'm called to do? Is this, is this, no, it's not. So put it down, stop being mentally addicted, stop avoiding planning ahead. Yeah. Um, that, that would be the main thing. Is, is that by honoring what life is calling you to, it, it is good for you and it is good for those around you. You have more free time, you have more resources, you have more health, you have more energy. Um, it's good for you, it's good for them. What trips people up is that planning ahead, delegating, building systems is uncomfortable. It takes work, it's hard, and they don't wanna do that. Yeah. So they just keep doing the work themselves and that's why they never grow and they always flounder and their income doesn't increase because it's too uncomfortable air quotes to plan and delegate. Get off the hamster wheel. <laughs> I want to go back to the baseball because I mean, I can tell you're having a lot of fun with it. I grew up playing baseball. My wife and I think we want to have kids someday. It's in the, the three year reevaluate plan, but I would love to, you know, be a coach and, and, just be immersed in any sports that, you know, my son or daughter ultimately want to be involved in assuming they do, of course, like, sounds like you do the research, you, you're doing it right. Do you have any advice for, for me in particular, but anybody else that's thinking about having kids or has young children and is looking forward to, you know, the athletic side of things and getting into sports with their kids? I don't know if it's advice so much as it is, um, buoys in the yeah. water. Uh, mile guideposts, if you will, uh, to help to help decide is this the path that you want to be on. Um, caveat: uh, what works for me and my kid might not work for you and your kid. Um, and also, caveat: you really have no idea until you have kids. And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> when you have the kid, it it physically changes the chemistry in your brain. Unfortunately. For some people, they realize that they do not want to be parents and they spend the next 20 years just resenting life and it's bad for them and it's bad for their kids. I don't really have a solution for that. It, it is unfortunate. Um, there are other people, conversely, that they never imagined that they would want to be parents and that kid comes out and they're like, oh my gosh, there is nothing else that, that I want to do. And they just find limitless stores of patience and, and graciousness and... Um, specifically though, relating to, to sports is, uh, this is one of those, those guideposts yep. that, that I would offer is, do you want your kid to live their best life or do you want them to live the life that you think is best for them? When I was in the symphony and I was having a kid, the symphony members were constantly coming out going, oh my gosh, what instrument is he going to play? What yeah. instrument is he going to play? And I was like, I don't know. How about we let him pick? Maybe he doesn't even want to play an instrument. Maybe um, he wants to be a board member. Maybe he would rather own a business and and help pay for all of this, um, right? Like, how about yeah. I let him pick? I have no way of knowing what my child is going to be interested in or what their passions are going to be. Yeah. And then one day my kid came home and um, he starts talking about the football game. Um, I didn't play sports growing up. I didn't, I don't really know anything about it. I don't understand. I didn't watch sports on TV and he's all into sports. And I'm like, where did this come from? So I had to learn how to, you know, watch football with him. And, and he was teaching me what stuff means and had to I go through that. that. 
And then he gets into baseball. And um, in baseball, he had a knack for it. Like he's always thrown hard for his age. So he's 12 now. He'll be 13 this month and he's throwing 70. Um, but even when he was only 10 and he was throwing 50, I was, I was legit terrified because as a kid, I was afraid of the ball. I wouldn't catch it. I would let it hit the ground. I'm not going to. So here I am as an adult wanting to be involved in my kid's life. And I would have to go to the batting cages during the day to practice catching, yeah. to practice helping my body calm down. Um, and, and the whole time we've been in baseball, and this is one of those mile markers, right? Do you want them to live their best life or the life that you think is best for them, uh, which includes their political beliefs and religious beliefs and all that. Absolutely. Um, and I'll talk about that more in, in a little bit. Um, I've got strong feelings about this. Um, I've always told him, if it's not fun, we can stop at any time. That's okay. I mean, it's okay. You, you don't, if you don't want to play baseball anymore, we can stop. Over time, I found out that I love being a baseball dad. Yeah. And if he was to stop, I would be sad. But I believe so strongly that it's his life and his right to choose. So he, he needs to be able to do that. Um, brief story, and then we'll get into one of those other mile markers to help. You know, is this really, hmm, you know, what are my values? What do I believe is best with this kid, right? So the, the story is, yeah, you might have heard, um, don't judge lest you be judged or something like that. You reap what yeah. you sow, some kind of spiritual something. Um, and so what happens is a dad will say, my my kids, my kids are are complaining. My kids are saying that I'm a bad dad. And, and I, there's how, how is that even possible? How could they possibly complain? You, know, you can hear the, you know, the arrogance, right? Look at how me. can they possibly complain that I'm a bad dad? My father, when I was young, he would never go to my games. He would never take me to baseball practice. I always had to hitch a ride with my friends. He would never buy me any equipment. I always had to beg, borrow, and steal from my other friends. He would never play catch with me. I'm at every one of my kids' games. I always buy them the best equipment. I'm always taking them to practice and play and catch. How can they possibly say I was a bad dad? Well, it's because your kids don't like sports. Yeah, I was waiting for that one. It's like you're they, doing all they're that. They're artists. That's what they're into. Yeah. They play piano and dance, and you think that stuff is stupid. Yeah. Just like your dad thought baseball was stupid. That's why your kids think you're a bad dad. So this gets into the other, the other mile marker, which is, is this a mindless automaton that it's your job to program? Or is this a tiny human being that needs a little bit of help in the beginning? If your friend was at your house and they spilled their milk. You'd be like, oh man, dude, is everything okay? Here, let me help you clean it up. Mm -hmm. But when it's a child, you need to be more careful. I can't believe you do that. How could you do that? You need to pay more attention. I can't believe you. Right? Yeah. If your friend was at your house and they're like, oh man, I'm really full. You're like, all right, that's cool. Let's go do something else. But when it's a child, it's no, you going to eat, eat your everything dinner there. And yeah. we wonder why they grow up to have eating disorders. Yeah. Case in point, a friend of mine, his child was um, just, I mean, it was crazy, right? It was like sneaking out and getting in trouble and stealing stuff through the neighborhood with his friends. I mean, it was, it was bad. Getting out of control. Yeah. And um, he and his, his wife, they started seeing a counselor just for themselves as parents. Like, what do we do? And one of the things that led to was acceptance of the fact that ultimately they cannot control another human being. And so they radically came to accept that truth and they let go of trying to make their kid better. They said, all right, here's the deal. No police, no fire. We're good. Anything else, it's your life. You get to choose. And instantly, hey, dad, you want to have lunch today? <laughs> hey, dad, what's going on? Like, you can imagine if your boss, if you're employed by somebody else, um, if your boss was like, oh, you don't like that project? 
well, I'm going to give you a project and make you be grateful for that project. I oh, you want a pay raise? You're not thankful for what I pay you around here? Well, we're just going to pay you less. I'm going to teach you. Yeah. Like You can imagine if your boss talked to you that way, you would, you would quit. You're out the door. You're out the door, man. So yeah, is this a, an empty robot that it's your job to program? You're, you're probably going to have a tough go of it. But if it's a tiny human being that maybe doesn't know some basics, like look both ways before you cross the road, you'll, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that 10 minutes right there because I mean, my parents embodied a lot of that, but these are just fundamental reminders for anybody thinking about being a parent. And I know I'm going to be coming back and listening to it again. So I think that's a great place for us to, to segue out, man. And I'd love to, to just give you the opportunity. What ask challenge or, or parting advice do you have for people listening? I would say if you had a sign as an on your office wall, yeah, I would want that sign to say, my only problem is that I don't have a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. There's something that happens like transformational in your life when you are given a bigger problem. When one of your relatives has cancer and yeah. now you have to oversee their business so it doesn't close while they're in the hospital while at the same time overseeing your business. And for that period of time, you become a superhuman leader, your ability to forecast and predict and plan ahead and delegate and ask for help and tell the whole truth and renegotiate and say, no, you're just amazing for those three months. Why can't you be that way all the time? So rather than complaining about the thing that's not working well in your life, realize that if you had a bigger problem, you wouldn't even care about it anymore because you'd have bigger things to be up to. I love that. I think I, I change out this board quite often behind me and that's what's going to go on there next. So nice. Jared, this, this has been a blast, man. I mean, for me personally, just a refreshing conversation, a great reminder of a lot of things that have been priorities for me over the last six months and in the season that I'm in, but just reinforces where I need to keep putting my attention and I'll leave it there. I appreciate you. Where can people find and support you online, website, socials, things like that? Where can we all check out the, the mindfulness gym? Uh, don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. Yeah. See if yeah. it makes sense. Um, mindsetperformance.co. So dot co, two letter suffix, mindsetperformance.co. And uh, just try it for yourself. Yeah. See if that way of thinking uh, makes a difference in, in your life. To all of our adventurous listeners, thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Please be sure to subscribe, download, and share this on social media or with someone you know will get some value from it. Leaving a review goes a long way in helping people find the show. And I personally appreciate reading them when they come in. So please go drop one if you have the time. We'll see you all next week. And remember, whether we're talking about business or the things that bring us joy outside of work, life is meant for exploring. So go out there and live it one adventure at a time.